It's all a matter of perception. Where we stand in space and time. There is no you or me that I can see. Only the illusions of the mind. Welcome back to Soul Perspectives. I am Kip. And I'm Evan. And today we are going to share our experiences with the summer of love and the counterculture, the freaks, the hippies, the flower children, the diggers. What do, what do we know about them? <laughs> well, we experienced a lot during that 50th anniversary year oh, since boy. the summer of love, 1967. 50th anniversary was 2017. We spent that year engaging with so many cultural institutions, museums, players, producers, promoters, fans, friends, the music scene, so many, the psychedelic scene at the Psychedelic Science Conference, so many different angles and facets, the rock, the drugs and psychedelics, um, the counterculture, the commune culture, we went to lectures, we read the books, we met the authors, we interviewed, oh darn near 200 in all, and we are not the same people we were before that happened. And lest anyone thinks this is a San Francisco-centric thing, much like the hippie movement and the counterculture movement itself, this was a global celebration. The influence and the impact of the counterculture cannot be denied any longer. The Beatles song, All You Need Is Love, came out in 1967. They were a British group and they were, as we know, popular the world over. And that became quite an anthem for the summer of love and that, that, that well, time, that vibe. Well, look at what we did on the 50th anniversary celebration of that song. We were marching in the Pride Parade, singing that song with the magic buzz, all the hippies just glorifying oh. one of their greatest accomplishments, gay rights. Yeah. yeah, so the Summer of Love happened 50 years ago, and another massive Summer of Love happened in our world again in 2017. And one of the big highlights was certainly riding in the, along with the magic bus, in and on and around the magic bus, in the LGBTQ Pride Parade and representing the Summer of Love 50th anniversary. And then... Um... Well, long story short, we were in the thick of it. So here's yeah. what we learned. Here's what we learned. Yeah. Well, one, the, we went into this, you know, asking questions like good journalists would do. What was the counterculture? What did it accomplish? Was it successful? Um, where do we go from here? And I think we found some really interesting information around on all those fronts. Um, it's undeniable the lasting impacts that we're feeling today from, as I mentioned, gay rights, cannabis, oh my God, uh, where are we at on that now? Um, slow foods, organic foods, women's rights, civil rights, on and on and on. None of this would have happened without the, counter the courageous kids and the counterculture. Yeah, and not to mention Eastern philosophy, Buddhism, and some of these traditions and practices, yoga as well, which uh, married nicely the spiritual element and the physical element that tie them together, meditation itself, transcendental meditation. These, the, the, the Beatles were doing that. The Beatles were taking the psychedelics and doing the transcendental meditation and playing music like all you need is love. These things all go right together. It's just that in all the cacophony of chaos that was the counterculture in the 60s and the hippies and the, 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 uh, that whole scene, it was easy to dismiss a lot of the aspects that were, oh, we love that song, but you don't go farther than that. But the fact is, there's so much there, there. And, the and without going anywhere deep on this part of it, that was probably one of my biggest surprises over the years was I watched the, the film on um, how the Beatles changed the world, and I was blown away. Because we love the Beatles, but let's face it, they've been trivialized to a certain extent. You watch that movie, there wouldn't have been a, a counterculture, there wouldn't have been a summer of love without them. They were foundational to it. Um, so we're talking about music, Beatles, rock. Let's let's like cover the topic because we're all the way over across go. the pond in England right now. But the Summer of Love, really, the epicenter was here in yep. Golden Gate Park in San Francisco at the concerts in the Panhandle 
on and around the time of Monterey Pop, The Human Being, that was a kickoff to the Summer of Love year, January 14th, 1967, that was an amazing event. We went to the 50th anniversary of that, but we'll get to that in a minute, because on the rock note, the, the music that was here in the Bay Area reverberated around the world. Names like The Grateful Dead, Janis Joplin, Big Brother and the Holding Company, this is where the pebble hit the pond. Yeah, this is where the pebble hit the pond and reverberated out into the world. And the music was a, a venue and an avenue for camaraderie and bonding and coming together. And you like this? I like that. Let's dance. Let's move. People have been dancing and moving and singing together in unison as far back as humans can go, right on your shirt. Those guys, <laughs> they were doing it. <laughs> so... Uh, and the, the music was an important part, and a lot of it emanated from here, the Bay Area of Northern California. You know, one thing that just hit me, and it's such a visual thing that we've never, I don't think we've ever really discussed it. Do you know what the, the counterculture in the 60s did more than anything else? They brought color back to our world. Mm. Think about how drab and dark and gray everything was coming out of the 50s. We didn't have clothes like this before that. Even the fashion changed. Everything changed. We opened up. We saw the world in a whole new way. Our perspectives mm. were expanded by them. Yeah. Um, so, speaking of the Grateful Dead and the music, the human being oh. that was in 1967, Grateful Dead played. It was something that we fondly referred to as the passing of the counterculture torch yep. from the beats, the beatniks, the beat poets of the 50s who were passing on just the, the torch of, hey, we're the counterculture. We're keeping something alive that they're not going to talk about at the mainstream, that they're going to demonize us for because they know we're a threat to what they're imposing on people to be their story and their world and their system and their chains. And... So then they passed that torch on to the flower children, yep. the, the people who had come to the Haight-Ashbury and Golden Gate Park in order to escape the what Lawrence Rinder at the Berkeley Art Museum called the heteronormative, mind-numbing, military-industrial, complex, educationally bankrupt society. That doesn't sound like fun at all. <laughs> so they wanted to take the white picket fence and tie-dye them, as it were. And so the BN was this gathering of the tribes, they called it. It was an event they put on in Golden Gate Park in the polo field, a free event. And... Uh, Timothy Leary was there, and Allen Ginsberg was there, and you had the Grateful Dead there, and so there was this meeting of the little bit older and seasoned, more experienced people who had been doing the culture circuits, the clubs, and the flyers, and the books, and the poetry, and the music, and everything, yep, yep. and getting the message out that we can do something different. We can tell a different story than the one they're trying to make us a part of that is so hard that we feel, we recognize now, is so harmful to us and our brothers and sisters around the globe. And it's such an important point to make that there was a torch pass. And obviously, we were then involved in the uh, 50th anniversary of the human being. There's a little mm -hmm. bit of a torch patching that went on there. And I think that's worth noting because, from my understanding, what I've read and what I've learned is that these cycles of the creative spirit awakening go in about 50 year cycles. And if you trace it back 50 years before the 60s, you were right there at the beginning of the 19th century. And boy, that was an enlightened time. And again, the forces of consumption, destruction, suppressed it. Then it burst out again after another period of war, suppressed again. And now here we are 50 years later. Ready to and, take it and is it coming out this time? So we have to thank the people who were there in the 60s for, for being that bounce point yep. for this ball to bounce along. They were it. No, oh, it didn't work. No, it bounced higher and farther. And where it landed now, we're making these things laws. You can grow marijuana in the United States now. You can, a, a, a gay man and a gay man can get married in the United States now. Yoga is a household name and a totally viable exercise option for anyone that's going to, as a side benefit, help them yoke, which is what yoga means, their mind and their spirit and their body 
connected, their heart. That's what all of this has always been all about, is that people get farther and farther from the heart in the story they're telling. It gets more harmful, more fearful, more desperate, right. and therefore more violent. And this has always been that countervailing force of that, whoa, 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 why are we killing each other? That, don't, that doesn't and feel right. And poisoning ourselves with and our poison. food. And exactly. poisoning the planet with the food and everything else. I mean, it's just, it's really crazy. It's like, you, you know, not to judge anything because everything happens for a reason. Uh, we wouldn't be where we're at having these conversations today if we haven't gone through everything. But it is, it is profoundly... Um, I'm not sure what, how, to, how to say th this period that we've gone through. Well, Jock said it best. These have been the dark ages. These have been the dark ages, and we're now coming out into the light. What we've done to ourselves and this planet, it's really, it's really striking. It's really phenomenal in the destructiveness of its, uh, pure destructiveness of its nature. And in a way, it seemed like the, the, the people who were crying out so loudly back in the 60s sort of saw this coming. Absolutely. But boy, they couldn't have seen this coming. Yeah. I mean, they were talking nuclear disarmament, though. Let, let, you know, let's remember that that peace sign is it means nuclear disarmament, and they adopted that as let's not blow ourselves each other up. Let's let's like at least stop there. And now we're saying no. This is the 21st century. We have powerful brains, and we know so much. Let's put them to use, thriving one and all thriving at last and so i think that's why the bounce of this ball hits so much harder now and just goes off into the stratosphere because we have things like jock fresco's work we talked about how the communes were a really interesting phenomenon of the 60s when people wanted to turn on tune in and drop out in the full sense of living out in the woods with a group of people in yurts and whatever and there was a lot of, uh, of examples of that happening, some involving people like the Grateful Dead and, and Diggers and Peter Coyote. And now, I mean, okay, they're doing experimentation on psychedelics Not right just cannabis, now. mushrooms, you, know? you name it. And, and so the, the, the consciousness expansion, the mind opening, the new perspectives, the new inroads that we're making, yeah. they were so intent on doing something different and finding a new way and a new place to go, but they didn't have Jacques Fresco. <laughs> and so exactly. now this bounce has this potential to say, okay, everyone who ever believed in this isn't right and what we're doing is harmful in us and we can do better and we have the resources and we should take care of ourselves and each other and the whole planet. And he's given us the tools and the means to do this. So anyone who's been rallying around this, we don't want the white picket fence, we want, we want to make our own fence our own way, but we want to be able to have the opportunity to survive and to thrive as much as anyone else. And, and the flip side is that is people end up resenting people who get something for nothing even though they're being cared for. Wouldn't we all want to be cared for? And so this, the Venus Project and Jacques Fresco's work is the ultimate example of that. And I think anyone who is looking to find that alternative, this is just that ultimate version of like where it goes. Well, it's our turn now to do what Andrew Blaufeld, Andrew Blaufeld did, uh, said at the BAM PFA exhibit, um, Circle for Utopia. It's our turn to prototype the possible. Because some of the other signs that the uh, counterculture were responsible for, the recycling symbol. Recycling, we owe recycling to them. Talk about prototyping the possible. They were, they were so far ahead of the curve on so many things, and it really is um, now our turn to build on everything that they started. And I want to comment on that too as well, because the, the, the theory is, and prevailing wisdom I would say, is that this whole concept of recycling is a psychedelic concept. It's that kind of thing where you take the psychedelics, you expand your mind, and all of a sudden you're thinking of things in a whole different way. Why don't I re do this, melt it, and make it again, right? And that, talk about the successes, the impact, the legacy, of that period, there, there it is. And, um, you know, and, and we could go on and on and on about this. And, and honestly, I think we've got so much to say that we kind of don't even know what to say to a certain extent. But we do invite you to come to Seoul and come to our Vimeo channel or wherever you find us on Facebook and come check out all of the document, all the work that we did in documenting uh, the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love from the interviews we did to the short documentary pieces we call Seekers that we're sharing now. Um, it's really, it's really so much more profound when you hear it coming from their mouths.
Absolutely. Absolutely. You're learning it right along with us as we're having these conversations and just having our eyes open and open and open. And the other one that I just want to bring up that goes right along with that recycling concept is this concept of organic food. Does anyone, anyone watching this think about whether they're eating food that's laden with chemical pesticides or whether they're eating food that was grown in an organic way? If so, thank the 60s counterculture in San Francisco because the first organic food store in the world was on Haight Street. And the reason it came about, as we understand it, is that after these chemicals were further developed in World War II, they were brought back and now used as pesticides. Oh, they kill the enemy soldiers over there. Have to find something to do with our chemicals. We'll have them kill the bugs on our plants here yeah, so yeah, we get yeah. our food, we can grow more and make That's more money funny. off it. And what happened was the counterculture people ate this pesticide-laden food and they were on the psychedelics, so they were expanded in consciousness, more aware of themselves, their natural state, their natural place in the, in, in the order of things, their ecology position, not their ego position, that they recognized the disconnect and that this thing didn't belong in the body. This chemical on this fruit doesn't belong in the body. So... That is where the idea of we need to do something that's natural again, not doing it this way. And so that's where the organic store came from. So the impact that, that we learned in this 50th anniversary year and all the interviews that we did is it's incalculable. It goes on and on and on and on. And like you said, the pebble in the pond reverberates around the globe and through our human family. And our, our hope, of, given all we've learned about what was at the core of the counterculture movement and what its ethic was, is that it's time. It's the dawning of the age of Aquarius, and we can do this, and it looks a lot like love, and it looks a lot like what we already are. And that, That's what it was. It, they, they were the first ones that said, hey, it's all about the love. It's all about love. It, without love, there isn't anything. And, and you know what, before we wrap this up, I, I want to make sort of a heartfelt plea. There's a lot of wonderful old hippies out there who devoted their life to trying to make the world a better place. And, and a lot of them feel that they didn't quite succeed. We don't feel that way at all. So next time you see a hippie, give them a hug. They really need some hugs. <laughs> Don't we all? So we thank you for joining us on Soul Perspectives. We're here every Thursday with new episodes, and we look forward to sharing our thoughts on the next subject with you when that comes along. Souldocumentary.love, because we need love too, and we'll love you back. Yeah, come sign up on our mailing list, and we share things over there you won't get anywhere else. And um, what can we say? And remember... It's all a matter of perception Where we stand in space and time There is no you or me that I can see Only do you